Welcome back to PokePaint, everyone. This is the series where I make Fakemon for a hypothetical Pokemon region. But if you're in this far already, then you probably know that. This week, I wanted to work on another one of those Pokemon tropes that are found in almost every game, and do some cave-dwelling Pokemon for the Trapor region. If you remember last episode, we had our first encounter with the evil team, Team C, and as a reward, the old sailor that we rescued agreed to give us a passage from our home island of Jornaway Island to the island of Voyajan, via Route 3. Along this route, there could be found Wingull flocking in the sky and shadows of wishy-washy schooling in the water. Suddenly, the engine begins to sputter and black smoke bellows from the smokestack as the sea captain veers towards the mountainous land in the distance. We have found ourselves on a barren stretch of beach bordered by bright green sea foam on one side and towering cliffs on the other. After examining the internals of the ship, the captain informs us that the ship has in fact broken down. Well, that took a detective to figure out. <laughs> and that we've found ourselves on the far side of Starlit Island. Although the western side where we find ourselves is unsettled, there is a small port town on the eastern side. There, we will be able to find the parts that he needs to fix his engine and we can get there through the cave system that runs through this island. Leaving the beach into the hole in the cliffside, we have found ourselves inside of a massive network of tunnels called Starlet Cave. Its namesake is readily apparent as the tips of the stalagmites hanging down from the ceiling above appear to be glittering like stars. As we make our way through, we stumble across our first Pokemon encounter. What appears to be a set of short stalagmites is actually a living creature. I've had the idea for a stalagmite Pokemon ever since I visited something called a Cenote Eco Park in Mexico. For a Pokemon that I've been thinking about for 10 plus years, I found it surprisingly hard to find a good design for. But as I went along, I developed a few shapes that I really liked and found a version that I could settle on. This first form, I wanted to make a skittish little cave creature sort of along the lines of Rog and Rolla. Taking the inspiration of stalagmites, it was difficult to land on a shape that wasn't... Uh, how do I say it? Well, if you know, you know. Its name would be seemingly uncreatively stalagmite. But there's actually more to this name than meets the eye. It's a portmanteau of stalagmite and mite, as in dust mite, referring to its very small size. This is going to contrast with the gargantuan size of its final form, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Stalagmite, the stalagmite Pokemon. They are naturally skittish and hide in dark caves. They can often be found on the shores of subterranean lakes, as unlike their rock-type cousins, they are not damaged by the water. Once I had the first form finished, the final two forms came together relatively fast. For the second form, I went from two-legged to three, as I wanted to illustrate it gaining more mass and appearing almost turtle-like to invite the comparison of a heavier creature. Its name would be Stalagmite, and it's probably pretty obvious what the root words are. I considered for either this form or the final form, making them a dual rock and water type, however, looking back at the Pokedex, I've made quite a few dual type final stage Pokemon, so for diversity's sake, I kept them just rock type. However, I still wanted to reference the way that stalagmites are formed in this Pokemon, as for those of you who don't know, they're formed as water drips in the same place over thousands of years inside of caves, carrying sediment that builds up and solidifies over time. It took me some time to figure out how to reference this. Once I found the solution, I felt like a genius. <laughs> Instead of the sturdy ability, which was my original idea, I gave this line the dry skin ability. This means that Rock's usual weakness of water will actually become their strength, as Pokemon with this ability are healed by water type moves rather than hurt by them. Stalagmite, the stalagmite Pokemon, and the evolved form of stalagmite. In dark, cool, and damp places, these Pokemon are found and in said places they can grow indefinitely. Left to their own devices, they will take hundreds, if not thousands, of years to evolve into their final form. The final form of our regional rock Pokemon is Stalagmiton. Being a portmanteau of Stalagmite and Ton, it is combined in a way so that the end of the word sounds like Titan. As of course, I wanted this Pokemon to feel massive and old. For a Pokemon line that was so hard to find the initial visual motif for, I adore how each of them turned out, as well as for my idea for its unique ability.
Stalagmiton, the stalagmite Pokemon of the evolved form of stalagmite. They lay dormant in damp caves. It is thought that they may be biologically immortal, as their body only grows with time. The oldest one to be found was over 50,000 years old. Those of you who watched the first season of Pokepaint may recognize this Pokemon, as this is my first regional form of one of my own Pokemon that I've ever done. Glitarwal is a Pokemon based on glowworms, and this Pokemon is the source of the lights on top of the Starlit Cave, where we found ourselves today. In its original Pokedex entry, I wrote that they were an invasive species from a region to the south, and well, that was a super early foreshadowing to the Trapor region. As such, this regional form is actually technically the original. As the Colonial version were based on glowworms as well as the ghost lights, I referred to that in its original form by the color palette as it was a psychic type, so that it could be used in the fourth gym. But this time, as I changed the color palette to match the real color of glowworms, I changed the type to be ghost type. Glitarble, the glowworm Pokemon. These Pokemon are highly adaptable and as such have invaded many foreign regions via long distance vessels. Trapor is, however, their home region. They use their ghostly lamp to attract prey, but are often overwhelmed by the would be prey in this juvenile form. In my original series, I turned Glitarvel into a beastly serpent called a Luma Serpent for its final form, but that's because I already had a glowing flying bug Pokemon in Pyrotine. And although I'm happy with Illumina Serpent, since regional forms often explore diverging evolution paths, I'm going to go that way with my original idea. Chrysalume is the cocoon stage of this line. To illustrate a sleepy nature, I turned the glowing ball above its head into a pattern that, if you squint, resembles a backward Z, which is a reference to the Z patterns which are used to depict sleeping characters. I also wrapped Chrysalume in what would eventually become its wings in its final form because I thought that would be a little more original than opposed to it just being string like every other cocoon bug Pokemon. Chrysalume, the glowworm Pokemon in the evolved form of Glitarbol. Once they have eaten their fill, those of their kind that are fit enough to climb to the bottom of the caves do so and evolve. There they rest and refuse to eat until they are ready to take on their final form. Real glowworms lose their bioluminescence when they reach their final form. However, I wanted to continue with the illuminated idea of this Pokemon. I landed on a moth-like idea instead of the fly of the real animal, as I had this idea of illuminated moth wings and I thought that they would look cool in some way. In my preliminary sketches, I quickly came to the idea of giving it a sprite-like body plan, very reminiscent of Celebi, and with that, the idea of making a ghost and fairy type Pokemon was born. Iliomoth, the glow moth Pokemon in the evolved form of Chrysalume. When they are ready again to evolve into their final forms, they gather in groups at the mouths of caves and evolve at sunset, flying away into the night sky. This event often coincides with the summer solstice and is called the Starfield Birth by locals. There's a third Pokemon that I plan to make that would be found here, but it actually fits better into the next episode for a few reasons. So I'll leave you guys with that bit of a cliffhanger and explain the inspiration behind the Starlet Island. Those of you who are geographically savvy will know that the Starlet Island is a stand-in for the real-life island of St. Croix, the southernmost island in the USVI, and the only of the two islands that I have not visited myself. Although the Starlet Cave is not based on any real feature on St. Croix, the port town of Starlet Island Port is based on two real places on the western side of the island, Frederickstead and Enneburg. Leaving the cave, we step out onto a windy path that descends to the paved streets of Starlet Port. The city is home to several beach resorts as it is a famous vacation spot in the region for the seasonal Starfield birth event. Before we can even start looking for the parts that we need, we come across who other than the sea captain who dropped us off earlier. He explains that right after we left, a fellow captain stopped by on his way to the island and helped fix up the boat. Well, isn't that convenient? Hey, at least our detour wasn't that much of a waste, as we've added six whole Pokemon to our Pokedex. Now that the boat is fixed, and the island of Voyage On is a straight shot across Route 4, we can set out again into the open waters. 
en route to our second gym battle. As always, this is my updated team, and don't feel free to comment your team in the comments below, as I'd love to see it. And thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see here and you want to see more like it, then feel free to subscribe and turn on the bell to get notified when I upload next.